Here we go. Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving. Can't hear you. What we are, we ought to thank Him. Love and praise Him a little more today. A whole lot more tomorrow. Ain't God good to give us so many blessings undeserving. That's what we are. We ought to thank Him, love and praise Him a little more today, a whole lot more tomorrow. Then we'll sing like we mean it. Ain't God good? Give us so many blessings undeserving. That's what we are. We ought to thank Him, love and praise Him a little more today. A whole lot more tomorrow. All right, we'll load up the bus right now. Hey, let's pray and let our pastor get up here for a few moments. When, Lord, we just, uh, it's Wednesday, we're back here in the middle of the week, Lord, and uh, we come, uh, we're about empty, so we need to get filled up again tonight, Lord, so when we go out tomorrow, we'll be able to tell more people about you, and we're going to thank you for doing that. But I pray right now, Lord, that you'll just bless our pastor, that you'll just lift him up and give him every word once again to... Stand here and tell us everything that we need to hear, Lord. So, Because uh, I know somebody's going to ask us something tomorrow, and uh, what we're going to hear tonight, we're going to be able to share that with them and help them. So thank you for doing that in advance. But, but Lord, we got a lot of folks that's on our prayer list. You know what needs to be done and uh, what's in their lives. And so if you would, would you touch each one? And we're going to thank you for that. But, Lord, we're going to tell you again that we love you and ask if you would now that you just go with us tonight, that you'll lead us and guide us, and we're going to give you all the praise because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Thank you. Oh, 15 of you, (laughs) whatever. Hey, look, I found out a long time ago. It doesn't have anything to do with the numbers. It has to do with the quality of the Word of God and God Himself. And if only one person is here and gets something from the Bible, then it's worth doing. So... Uh, we're thrilled to have you here. A lot of times on Wednesday evening, especially during the summertime, people come in and they're tired and they decide, well, you know what, I'll just wait and go Sunday. A lot of, And I'm thankful that you didn't decide that. You're here, so we're glad to have you in the house of the Lord with us. I want you to take your Bibles, go with me quickly over to the First Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3. Uh, Paul has been writing to Timothy, and he's instructing him literally on how to behave himself in the house of God or how to construct ministry inside the house of God, how how to ordain elders, how to make sure. And we dealt with the issue uh, Sunday night of, of the woman in her place in church and how that the woman is to learn in silence. That doesn't mean she doesn't say anything. It simply means she's not argumentative. And that she learns it from her husband if she has a husband that's that's there. And that Paul said to make sure that we knew that women were not allowed to teach or preach or to pastor. So those are the absolute understandings out of out of First Timothy chapter two. And usually, almost always, when we get to these issues, have so many questions because uh, there you know you have a, a lot of it going on and. And people will say, well, what about so-and-so? Well, wait a minute. All I know is what God says. What people do about that is between them and God, not me. I don't, I don't run their lives. But I can tell you what the book says. In fact, you don't need me to tell you what the book says. You can read it and find out what it says. Say amen. It's in there. And then what you do about it is up to you. And... Uh, he made sure that we understood that. Because he said in verse 12, and we just touched on that, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority or have a position of authority over her husband or, or any other male man in the church over the man, but to be in silence or subjection. That doesn't mean that she doesn't have the right to speak up. And let me, let me say something. Uh, I've said this the other night, and I say it again today, and I want to continue to say it. That does not diminish the ministry of a woman. A woman has a ministry that that men can't fulfill. First of all, a woman is to teach the younger women, and the older women are to teach the younger women and the children in the church. 
And it's vitally important to have that ministry that works in the church. We have women's Bible study here. Sister Connie just walked in uh, at, on Monday nights and Tuesday. And uh, you have an opportunity if you if you can't come during the week or uh, during the day, if you have to work, then you're able to come at night on a Monday night if you can come uh, and try to be. And by the way, mentoring is 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 important. But most mentoring takes place congr- congruently. That means usually during a Bible study or whatever. And there are sometimes that people can and some of our ladies do call other ladies aside and try to help them in their in their walk with the Lord. But. This, this is vital, and this is one of the areas where the church has collapsed. It's allowed this thing to go on that with no one raising their voice because they're afraid that they're going to create, a, uh, create hardship or, or cause someone to be angry with them. Well, well, listen to me carefully, and I say this. I don't like people being angry with me, but if you want to get angry with me for teaching the Word of God, then go ahead and help yourself. Amen? I mean, that's all I can tell you. I, it's not going to make me feel better. But here's the problem. You don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with the man that wrote the book. And you need to deal with him about that. Now, chapter 3, Paul is going to get into the qualifications of, of overseers, bishops, or pastors. And there are words that are synonymous in this particular office, of course, is the word elder and overseer and pastor and bishop. And every pastor or bishop or overseer is an elder. He has to qualify as an elder in the Scriptures. And here's another area where we've fallen down is we have men that are unqualified filling church offices. And when you do, then the problem is, is that um, usually we have a tendency to to want to vote people in and or put people in positions because of a lot of different reasons. But we better make sure that they qualify according to the word of God if we're going to fill offices of leadership. And remember, if you were here on during the end of our secret church, and by the way, we will be having one this coming Friday night at 7 o'clock, we spent a great deal of time talking about the office of bishop, elder, uh, pastor, uh, those, those offices that are being fulfilled here. But we're going to drop in in chapter 1, uh, uh, I mean, sorry, chap, chapter 3, verse 1, and it's picking up on the same the same. Um, subject matter that he dealt with in chapter 2. He's just extending it now, and he's talking about leadership and the need for leadership to be qualified according to the Scriptures. So he said in chapter 3, verse 1, that this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, and the bishop primarily, his, his office tends to lend to be superintendent. That's what the literal translation of the word means, to superintend. Now, the pastor is the shepherd. And of course, here's the same office, but there's just two sides of the same office. A shepherd is the part that cares for the sheep, and the bishop is the part that superintends the sheep or is responsible for the sheep. So it's not just a voice, uh, an office of authority. It's an office of a tremendous amount of responsibility. Because remember, the Bible tells us that we are, the, you are, the congregant, is to submit themselves to those in authority, uh, which is the pastor, uh, shepherd, uh, bishop, uh, elder, office in the church, you're to submit yourself to them as one that may give account, that uh, we may watch for your souls as one that must give account in the day of judgment. So we that are in leadership, that qualify for leadership, will stand before God as to how we teach you. That's the first thing. The second thing is how we superintend you. And the third thing is how we care for you as a pastor does his sheep. So simply said, a pastor, teacher, elder has no right to teach or preach to those that he doesn't love like his own flock. Secondly, he must always take the oversight. That means he must keep the position of authority. And that means that he stands in a position of truth at all times. No matter who it, it doesn't matter who it is, he can't take positions because of personalities. It deals with anybody and everybody, whoever they may be. And then, of course, he must lead the church, and that means he must lead by example. And so we're going now to find out what Paul told Timothy, make sure that these men qualify according to the Scripture. So he said, now it's a true saying, if a man desire, that's a wonderful word, 
The word desire means to reach after. Uh, if a man desire, if he reaches after this office, and of course we'll find out a little bit later, but and the next time that he uses the word desireth, it's actually a different Greek word, which means he has a heart feeling. Not that he just that he just wants this, but that he feels that this is what God wants him to want. So all of a sudden now, it's not just something somebody decides, I think I want to do this. Then we find out that later, wanting to do something has nothing to do with doing it unless God gives you the heart's desire. And by the way, he never gives the heart desire of this office except to those who qualify. He qualifies the call and he calls the qualified. So be sure many people decide, I think I just want to preach. I think this is what I want to do. Well, that sounds good, but you better might check and make sure that's what God wants you to do also. Because if God hasn't called you, you're headed for a mess. Amen? I've seen too much of that. And, and, and boy, I'm thankful. I've heard people say, well, I just wish God hadn't called me. Well, I don't think so. I'm thrilled to death that God called me. Uh, to pastor, why? Because I desire that office. If I didn't desire it, uh, that I wouldn't believe God would be in me being there. So he said, he desireth a good work. And there's, here's, now someone says, well, you know, I've heard preachers say, boy, it's really tough pastoring. Well, let me tell you what I found out. Pastoring is a heart thing. If your heart isn't in it, get out. If you can't love people and you don't have patience with people and you can't put up with people that, that, that other people don't want to put up with, then you aren't called a pastor. Because people have problems. I don't care who you are. You are going to have some difficulty. And the shepherd is to help the sheep. Now, there's a time, and of course, I know some people say, well, I just wouldn't put up with this. Well, that's because you're not the pastor. The pastor puts up with whatever he feels like he needs to put up with to help the sheep. There are times that the sheep needs to be sheared. And the pastor has to do that too. That's not always a good thing. And, and the sheep's... And he doesn't, he wants the sheep, wants to do what he's supposed to do. And I, my counseling comes pretty quick, pretty short. If you're not going to do what I tell you to do, don't come back. It's not going to help you. I can't help you. And that not being ugly. It's just saying, I don't have any, anything else to tell you but what God says. And if you don't want to do what God says, then you just, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm going to do. Just sit there and tell you the same thing over and over. So he's saying that this is what the office is about. And then he says, a bishop or a superintendent then must get the word must. This is not something it would rather work this way. This is a must. He must be blameless. Wow. When I first read this, I thought, well, that wiped me out. What does that mean, blameless? Well, it means one that's not, cannot be held blamed, uh, cannot be held to blame, but it's talking about a public blameless. It means a man that, that has a good testimony, a man that keeps his testimony right before God and also right with people. You do know that there's no such thing as someone who has a testimony that everybody loves. I don't care how close you are to God, somebody will pin the tail on the donkey, no matter who. So, he says that, that that man should have a have a good standing among the Christian community, and he's also we're also going to find out that he needs to have a good testimony in the in the community, not just with Christians, but also with other people, with those that are out. We'll find that out in just a moment. But then he must be blameless. Then he also must be the husband of one wife. Now there's been a whole lot of uh, argumentation about this particular scripture. A lot of them will say, well, it means he could never have been married before. Well, if that's the case, then a widower could not qualify as a pastor. First of all, if you'll take the rendering of the word, the word literally means, or the phrase literally means a one-woman man. It has nothing to do with divorce or remarriage. It has to do with a man that is that is committed and absolutely blameless in his married life. He is true to his wife. He is not flirtatious. He is not, he is not out, he is not, doesn't carry the idea of a, of womanizing, and he certainly is an adulterer. And that's basically what it refers to. A man who keeps, who has, by the way, if you've got more than one wife, you don't need to do nothing. Right? But one, and that means you're true to the one you have. And that's the meaning of the Scripture. And then he says, 
also vigilant, a man who stands guard. By the way, this is, and this is talking about over the flock. A man who stands guard. A man who protects his flock. Now, let me say something to you. Protecting the flock has to do a great deal with loving your flock. Loving them enough to put them before you many times. In fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but as a Christian, you don't have any, you don't have any other alternative. Everybody's supposed to be before you. Well, Jesus said you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me daily. And to look on others works more than your own. So, boy, I tell you what, this will take care of the pride and the arrogance, won't it? It should. And so he says you, you need to be vigilant. And not only vigilant, you need to be sober. That doesn't mean uh, not intoxicated. It means of a sober mind. A mind that thinks in a, uh, in a, in a sober avenue. It doesn't mean that there's, there's no hilarity in your life. It doesn't mean that there's, there's not any humor. But what it does mean is that when it comes to spiritual things, that those are the first things in your life. As you guard your flock by being sober-minded and thinking about the things that are, that are good for them. And then also, he must be of good behavior. And of course, that has to do uh, of a person with, with modesty. Uh, a person that, that conducts himself in such a fashion in the world or in the church. Wherever he is, is that he conducts himself in a Christian manner. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I got to say something. Uh, this 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 bothers me um, when th- this this thing is not a plaything. You get that? It is not a plaything. This is a war. We're in a war, and I don't know. We have we don't know it yet in America. I don't think we still think that that this thing is just a a recreation field. But uh, I I got just this past week I got a uh, I usually get information on the Voice of Martyrs. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Uh, 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 Wormbrand and some of the others. But let me tell you something. We ought to be ashamed if we can walk through this world and not have a broken heart about our brothers and sisters in the third world countries and not have any desire to do anything except just take care of ourselves. Isn't that a sad state of affair when Christians get to where it's all about us? It's not. It's all about the body of Jesus Christ. And holding on to the things that are that is of good behavior, modest, keeping keeping your mind on the things that should be there. Also, he's supposed to be given to, uh, given to hospitality. My wife loves this one because it literally means that we're to have an open door policy at our home. That's simply said is that the home that we have isn't ours; it's given to us. To use for the glory of God. And the pastor takes on the idea. And by the way. You're all invited to our house. I would prefer that you call my wife. Before you come. <laughs> I can see the dust bunnies anyway. Okay. And by the way. If you come to see my house. Stay away. If you come to see me. Come on. Oh by the way. Our house is clean. I need to make that sure. Somebody say. What are you doing? Anyway, it, it doesn't matter. Let me get to the next thing. Apt to teach. It's an amazing thing how so many people feel like teaching is just reading the Bible and standing up and talking about it. I, I promise you, the preparation for teaching should spend a tremendous amount of time in the Word of God and on our knees to make sure we have clarification because what we tell you from this pulpit is as if God said it. And it better be right. That's scary. It is for me. Because I've had to come back before and say, guess what, guys? I was wrong on that thing. And uh, and a a man that doesn't, that that won't go back and clarify a problem if he's had one, and I don't know anyone that's ever preached for any length of time that hasn't. God changes my theology with this book. And if he doesn't change yours, then you're stuck in your little rut and God's not going to do anything with you anyway. Amen. But he said that we're to be apt to teach and a pastor who is a preacher. And by the way, you can find usually one or two things. You'll find either a good preacher or a good pastor. It's hard to find two in one. But there's pastors, one side of the coin, teachers, the other side. He should be able to do both. 
And a good teacher, if he isn't a good pastor, shouldn't pastor, no matter how good a teacher or preacher he is. So, also, not given to wine. Uh, And that literally means to abstain. Uh, Also, it has to do with an attitude. I was looking up the word and looking up the phrase, and it... uh, it really means not ready to quarrel also. That's the phrase that falls in there with it. And it, it, it tends, it tends to, to lend itself to this thing. A person that, 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 that has wine or alcohol seems to be quarrelsome. Now, I don't know how, how that works out in natural life, but it's in there. If you'll look up the word sometimes or that phrase, not given to wine. And then he talks about not being a striker and not greedy or filthy lucre. And of course, uh, you, if you're if you have the King James, and uh, when it talks about no striker, he's not a brawler, someone who who is argumentative and uh, who constantly. How many of you know that if you disagree with the pastor, you might as well pack your bags? It may, you ever been in churches like that, where if you ever disagree with the pastor? And any pastor that won't sit down with anybody that disagrees with them and take the Scripture and show them why he stands where he does on something without being offended by that, then he's got a problem. He's got a problem. Anyone should be able to... And by the way, if you don't agree with me, you need to bring your Bible. But if you don't agree with me, make sure you bring your Bible and let's make sure we get it cleared up. And I'll say it this way. I'll take anything the Bible says if you will do the same. But don't come to me telling me that this is wrong because the Bible says this in one place and this is the way you got it. Uh, We're going to get it in context. Amen? So he says we can't be argumentative or a striker. Then he says not greedy of filthy lucre. Now, I've heard people say, well, this means that a preacher ought not to be money hungry. That's not what it means. Let me show you what it does mean. The word filthy ought to help you understand that it's not just talking about money as, as itself. It really means a person who is willing to do just about anything for money. A person who's willing to uh, put their uh, reputation on the line in order to get money. The word filthy means that you get money the wrong way and you're willing to jeopardize your reputation for it in order to get money. So anyone with a questionable uh, uh, questionable making money from a questionable source or whatever, then that that's what that lends itself to. It doesn't lend itself to someone who uh, who who likes money or or needs money. But I, I it will immediately. You need to say this: uh, the word lucre literally means money, and I'm convinced that two things will take down most Christians in America today. One is money, and the other one is sex. You can listen to me. One of those two, if not both, are the most difficult things in Christianity today. Not just preachers, but just about anybody. So you need to guard yourself well in both those areas. And if you don't, I promise you, you say, well, I I, I don't worry about that. Well, then you're stupid. I say that in love. But I promise you, I don't care how well you think you got it together, you sure better watch yourself in those areas because there's nobody in this world that can't be tempted in the right circumstances in the right place, and you better build a guardship against that. Amen? <coughs> that didn't cost you anything. And, and be patient. Boy, that one, that one hit me. Patient. Literally, what does it mean? Well, what does be patient mean? It means to wait and don't jump to a conclusion too quick on a person's problem. And by the way, it's a, it's a takeoff of the word long-suffering. And the word long-suffering is God, one of God, the favorite description for God. He's long-suffering. We're to be long-suffering with each other just like God is with us. How would you like God to treat you like you treat other people? Better think about it because he said, the way you do is the way you treat me. Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brother, you've done it to me. You know, we'll treat people and we'll flick them off. We'll do all kind of things. And, and, and then, you know, we think we run to church and everything's all right. I don't think so. 
It's, it's really important. How I don't know how I can say this. How we treat each other is vitally important. So be careful. Be patient. Not a brawler, nor coviousness. That's not greedy. That's what it means. Not to be greedy. And then it says, one that ruleth well his own house. Two things that need to be here. It means that he needs to be he needs to have the authority over his wife. His wife needs to be in subjection. By the way, you can't make your wife be in subjection. All you can do is live a kind of life that will help her live for Jesus Christ, and that includes subjection. You can't and by the way, ladies, you can't you can't make your husband be the leader in the family that he needs to be. God has to do that. So here's what I need to tell you. You need to live up to your qualifications and let God take care of your partner. Did y'all get that? Here's why. I can't make my wife do anything. She can't make me do anything. Leonard can't make Christine do anything. I can tell you right now. But here's what we can do. We can live our lives in such a way that it would be an encouragement for them, for them to live their life according to the Word of God. Amen? That's what we're there for. So he says that we're to rule our house well, and then he says also, one having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, listen to me carefully. I have seen so many people say, well, you know, I, I, I get my kids are just run wild. Uh, as, as long as they're living with you, you're responsible for them. But once they get grown and walk out the door, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know. There's nothing you can, all we can do is plant the seed and love them and give them what they're supposed to have while they're growing up. But once they walk out the door and they're on their own, they're, uh, they're between, that's between them and God. From that point, you're not responsible for a child that's, that's of age and then is living on their own. You can't, you can't do anything about that. But those children that at home, we're living in a time where you're going to have a time keeping your children under subjection. You hear me? You know why? We've got a world out there that's teaching them and a television that's teaching them everything else but that. It's teaching them that rebellion is the way to go. That mom and daddy, in fact, almost every sitcom I've seen lately makes, and I don't like, I don't watch the stupid things, it, but it makes what ones I have seen, it makes the daddy look like an idiot. And I greatly agree, most of us men are idiots, but not that bad. And I think that's the worst thing that can happen. Ladies and gentlemen, don't you put each other down in front of your children. Because I promise you, they'll nail on that thing, and the first thing you know, you've got a big problem, bigger problem than you want. Amen? So he said, having your children in subjection with all gravity. And look at verse 5. It says, for if a man know not how to rule, and this is a key, his own house, how can he take care or rule the church of God? Because he's in a position of authority. So if he isn't doing what he needs to do in his life, and by the way, again, you can't say, well, his children aren't in subjection, or his wife isn't in subjection. Two things you got to, but you did know that he didn't say that the wife was being subjection here to be qualified as a pastor. And here's why that's important. Uh, a man can't, as I said, can't make his wife be in subjection and a wife can't make her husband be the head of the wife that he should be. But a man must be living the kind of life to be an example in that manner. And then he said also, not a novice or a, or, or a new believer. Uh, by the way, you can be an immature believer if you've been saved for 25 years. You're still a novice in the sense of having biblical understanding. So it's someone who does have, is grounded in the faith, who who understands the major Bible doctrines and the Scriptures, because how can you teach something you don't know? And so you said you are to be grounded in the Scriptures. And, and here's why. If he's a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, and by the way, pride and conceit come real close behind to anyone who's in authority. But I can tell you what, there's no place in, in, for an elder in a church for pride and arrogance. That's the worst thing that can happen. It'll, it'll, kill, it'll kill your witness. It'll kill your testimony. And if you start treating people like they belong to you, you've got a problem. Amen? They don't. I don't have any church members. They belong to Jesus Christ. Someone called me the other day and said, 
Well, I just need to tell you, one of your church members is visiting over so-and-so. I said, I don't have any. I don't know who you're talking about. I don't have any church. By the way, if people want to go to another church I, and they feel like that's where God wants them to go, I'm going to be praying for them that God will bless them and encourage them. Amen? Because if they're not supposed to be here, let them be where they're supposed to be. My goodness alive. I have people stand around guarding the door, afraid one of them will get out. That's so crazy. Uh, and it, while he's lifted up with pride, he'll fall into condemnation of the devil. Under the judgment of the devil. Pride will cause you to fall under the judgment of the devil. Isn't that scary? Man. Mm. And then he says, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. That means people outside the church, even non-believers. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Okay, we're going to end there. Has anybody got any questions about any of the things that we touched on? I wish I had about a month to spend on leadership in the church. And also, Christians' commitment and lifestyle, it's, it's become atrocious. And I say this in a loving kind of way, but folks, we dishonor Jesus Christ so badly sometimes with our lifestyle. And, I'm, and I know that that's not our intent, but what I have found is and when, I've, when I've talked to Christians a lot of time, they say, well... Well, you know, everybody else does it. Well, if everybody goes to hell, you want to follow? I wouldn't think so. I think I'd want to do what God said and do my best to keep myself where I need to be. And, uh, and you can't be responsible for anybody else. No one else have any questions, right?